Hi, welcome. I'm Tiffany Fox Quintana, the Vice President of Marketing here at Stampley. And joining us today is Egeni from SEMrush. Not SEMrush, SEMrush. Egeni, why don't you introduce yourself as well? Yeah, good morning, Tiffany. So, yes, uh, uh, my name is Evgeny Fetisov. I'm a CFO with uh, SEMrush, an online visibility software uh, company. And uh, I've been with the company for more than two years now. And before that, I was a CFO with two other public companies. And then anything before, before that is a long story anyway. <laughs> oh, well, we like long stories, so we <laughs> might have to dive into that. So uh, interesting, right before we jumped on, you had mentioned, I'm, I'm a marketer, obviously, and I'm very familiar with your product and tool. But interestingly, we've always called it SEM Rush. I'm curious, like, what was now you guys are calling it SEM Rush? And I'm wondering if what the story is behind that. Uh, I don't know the full story, but I guess this is a part of the evolution of the brand. Uh, we realized that calling it SEM Russia versus M Russia is just more cumbersome and uh, people get confused whether they capitalize the three initial letters or not. So, SEM Russia it is. So, I think SEM Russia it is. I will make sure everyone knows that moving forward. <laughs> so, I actually do want to dive a little bit into your, you know, your journey to becoming a CFO. I think there's lots of people out there who are looking to take, you know, a similar path, but um, I think some of the most interesting things are kind of your detours and things along the way that got you to your CFO role. So I'm wondering if you could just kind of walk us through that a little bit. Uh, did you always know you wanted to be in finance? Uh, I would say almost yes. I mean, initially I wanted to be a coder and then, uh, I mean, somehow I detoured into finance and spent my initial years with banks. I was a trader. I was doing foreign exchange and then uh, moved on to consultancy, spent some time with McKinsey & Company, did my entrepreneurial stint for a few years, and then uh, joined a private equity fund. Great. So I was on the private equity side for like, uh, quite some time, like, more than five years, close to six years, and I was doing stock exchange investments. So there we invested into the second largest Russian stock exchange called RTS uh, back in 2008. Uh, we, we became a large shareholder. We sold the company to the large stock exchange to form Moscow Exchange in 2011. And then wow. uh, in 2013, this company invited me to become their CFO just right before the IPO because I knew the company well. I've been, in essence, selling it to the other investors for years before. Yeah. And uh, here I was uh, a CFO of an almost like, a large public company. Uh, and did you take them public? Yes, I did take them public. The interesting fact is I joined the company uh, literally two days before the IPO roadshow started, <laughs> okay. so which, which, wow. which surprised some of the investors. But then I had to explain that I was with the company for years before that and I knew it. And uh, so it wasn't entirely like it wasn't entirely new to me, but it was fun uh, in terms of getting up to speed with uh, uh, that pace. Um, you know, taking a company public is um, a big thing for, I have a lot, of, a lot of friends that are in finance, have become CFOs, and that's always kind of like a milestone for them. So is that, was that primarily the reason you decided to, to join the company for that experience, or was it that you were really engaged in what they were doing and the belief in all of that? I guess IPO was a secondary reason, right? So it's it's it, it's an interesting project uh, by itself, right? And, and as you rightly said, people will call it a milestone in their careers. But I was so engaged with the company, and I was so interested in its development. So, so I thought the CFO role with the company which I was working with, my portfolio company, would be a great next career step. And then being a CFO of a public company also is also yeah, I would say an interesting challenge by itself. Yes, and definitely a, a milestone that people want to achieve. I mean, being an officer in a public company is, is a great career <laughs> goal to reach in that sense. And then what brought you to SEMrush? So I've been with Moscow Exchange, then I was a CFO with Luxoft, which gave me an international angle. And I've been a CFO for Luxoft before it was sold to DXC Technologies in 2019. And then I was introduced to the team at SEMrush, and they interviewed me. We liked each other, I guess. <laughs> and then I joined them in uh, July 2019 to take the company public, among other things. Great. So now you're a vet at that. You just go in and take companies public. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we can count two, yeah, two IPOs. Hey, it's more yeah. than one, right? <laughs> so. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, interesting, you say, you know, you guys liked each other and you joined. Um, one of the things that I'm really curious about is 
how you do interact with those additional departments and companies throughout your organization, and what are some of the best practices that you might be able to share with us on creating that great engagement with different departments like us big spenders over here in marketing? <laughs> it's a good question. So I guess the, the way I think about the engagement between finance and other departments is the key thing is the exchange of data, right? So we yeah. treat them, our other departments as our clients. Our key goal is to give them data to make for them to make decisions, right? So we have to build a model of the company which will capture all of the key KPIs, right? And we will distribute it to the respective departments so they can make decision, decisions on the fly in a way. And we will also need to be collecting data from them to understand how to forecast the business going forward. Say we would be talking to marketers and trying to dig deep into what's happening with traffic in a particular country to understand if this is something which is relevant for the business going forward. If, say, when we look for at Germany in, in two years' time, what what is that that we expect to see like in, in, in connection with Semrush, for example? Right, and how will that affect our growth and uh, and cost, et cetera, et cetera. So we are getting deep into the weeds, understanding the business and key drivers, and then uh, first of all, gathering this information and getting this information back to our peers in front of it. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Do you um, does like the BI business intelligence report into your organization? Uh, uh, we have actually two BI groups. In a way, so one which works with uh, our operations or business parts, because these guys will be going much, much deeper than we need to know. In a way, because they will be very granular in, in terms of analyzing the data, and I have a separate BI group which reports to me, which actually um, like merges what they do with the financial data. Mm-hmm. Right. So they 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 are like they are like interface between us and uh, and, and operations. Got it. Got it. And. Are you guys doing most of the um, analysis for some of the different departments like marketing or are they providing their own analysis to you? You know what? We actually do both. I mean, we do get we do give them the analysis, which is largely working top down. Right. So we're yeah. saying here's what we see in the revenue growth and here's what we think drives that. And here's what we think uh, is caused by you or this is where you're. May not do enough, and then we'll try to bridge them towards what they see because they maybe think you know what we're doing great and things are looking like things are perfect. And then we discuss the differences that we see and then how we can what needs to be changed in a way. Right. So it does sound like you've got good uh, collaboration between your teams uh, with the various departments, especially one like marketing as well. Um, are you using any specific, uh, do you guys meet regularly? Are you doing everything over Zoom these days or how are you collaborating? So we're now meeting more, we, which I personally enjoy a lot because that's uh, my, my, my major tool is my whiteboard. right? So that's where we meet and that's where we discuss and brainstorm. We, we do, of course, use a lot of Excel and, and presentations and spreadsheets, what, what have you, right? Or BI tools. But... I mean, whiteboard with a marketing team in one room is my sometimes it's much more efficient than ten Anything Zoom calls. Else. Yeah. Do you find that you have to explain finance concepts to a lot of different uh, marketers so they can work better with you? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I think they're very well educated into the broad terms. We don't need to be very account like technical, like doing te- any technical accounting stuff with them. Right. So what we do is we say, here's how we look at revenue and how it uh, is disaggregated into the key drivers, which is which which they can relate to. And then we clearly can talk costs, which is very simple, right. yeah, well, relatively simple, I'd say. But every we, we can talk, talk marketing budgets. Yeah, so they, would, they would understand that. So I'm curious, something that a lot of people do uh, ask me from time to time, especially since, you know, I've worked at multiple startups. But I'm curious from your perspective, as far as like allocating budget to various departments like marketing, do you have any good standards on that? Like what percentage of revenue should be allocated to budget for marketing or any guidelines in that sense? I don't think there will be a uh, one magic number which will, you know, will work for every business. It it, it really depends on how you drive your growth of the business and what's where at which stage you are right if you're a high growth company where marketing plays a very important role you won't be one as you will be willing to spend as much as possible right assuming your unit economic works 
Mm -hmm. If you are a more mature company where costs are important, that's probably will be a over. There'll be a lesson number. Yes. And you'll be squeezing marketers as, as hard as you can. There's yes, I've been, so. definitely been in those situations where it's like, yeah, cut it more, cut it more, cut it to the yeah. bone. This is not, there's still fluff in there. So that was. Uh, so the challenge that, yeah, the challenge, I'm sorry for interrupting you, Steve, but the, the, the challenge that we're facing with our marketing team is we're saying like, can you spend more? Mm -hmm. Or tell us how you can bring us more customers. So that's an interesting uh, dynam dynamics that we're having. Well, I think it's, you know, and I think it's all about the phase of the company too, right? Like the larger a company gets, the more they do become cost conscious in those, in those aspects. But if you're still growing and it's growing fast, I, you definitely, as a marketer, get that pressure, like push more in, push more in. Mm -hmm. But we've been trained over the years to show return, show yeah. return, you know. That's Absolutely. always the uh, challenge on that on that part. Mm -hmm. How do you um, so when you're looking at what marketing does, for example, how do you analyze whether it was successful or not? What I mean, because like a lot of people could invest in brand, but you're not going to see directly any attribution to it. How do you guys measure that from that perspective? I mean, the most obvious indicator is how many new customers we got into the door. Right, so that's uh, yeah. that's the easiest one, and given the short, relatively short, I would say, uh, at customer acquisition cycle, we can see the results uh, uh, quickly. quickly. We know that if we spend money this quarter, we most likely be seeing substantial part of our results this quarter as well. Right. So we know right. what we're doing, and then the, our guys are running fairly sophisticated attribution models, so they would know which channels work, which uh, not working as well, or which not working as like as good, and. Uh, well, that's I am how curious we'll if that. you know, like, is most of your growth through organic? Oh, it's now it's roughly half 50-50 paid versus organic. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So when you are working with other departments, what would you say is the next biggest department that you're working with uh, is that may be spending as much as a marketing department, that you have to have those clear lines of communication? Now, product and development on our site. We are a software company, so our engineers is the core of what we have in terms of our building our product and making sure that our customers are happy. So these guys are very important. Right, higher, 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 right? Yes, uh, <laughs> if if we can, right? So that and higher and make sure that they can work efficiently. Yes, exactly. It's definitely been an interesting hiring market these days yeah. too. Tell yes. me, how have you been finding that uh, on your side in finance? So two things. First of all, we are um, facing a hiring challenge on our side, adding to the team, right? So we, I mean, it's it's become slightly easier with us being a public company. So you know, we are now paying more attention to what we have to offer. Right. However, having said that, we still have to fight for talent. That's one thing. So we, we're trying to stuff our own team. Another challenge is that when we helping our colleagues manage their budgets, we're facing the challenge of uh, them having to pay more and then us pushing back on that to the extent that it makes sense. So I guess we have to really find this uh, fine balance between uh, managing the budgets or saving or at least not spending as much and getting the right people on board. Right. I mean, how have you guys addressed the whole COVID situation, working remotely, going hybrid, eventually going back into the office? Have you guys established any thoughts on that? So we have been, interestingly enough, we have been very well prepared for the remote work. I mean, the way we were set up, for us, there was virtually very little change. So people weren't working home, but the, the setup that we have from the, say, technical perspective was very much remote ready. Because we've, uh, we've been in five countries by that time, and we've collaborated like via Zooms or Google Meets, what have you. And that's just continued. So there was very little disruption apart from us, us not being able to meet each other in the office in the first months. And then we fairly quickly came back and then we're now back for a year now, I think, on and off uh, with uh, whatever local restrictions we have in different countries. Oh, great. So you are back in the office. Are you full time then? or I'm, I'm personally full time for more than a year now. OK, wow, that's great. Uh, I'm out here in California and I think we're still in lockdown, it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes on that end. But, um, you know, one of the uh, interesting things is, you know, finding that right talent during this market. Um, you know, when, when the market is more uh, employer, f you know, friendly, it's easier to go through and look for that right candidate uh, and, 
to that extent. And so I'm curious, like when you're looking for people to join your team, what are some of those top characteristics that you're really looking for, or even their background that's going to be successful uh, in finance? I'm looking for the track record when I read, when I read the resume, when I haven't met the person yet. So I'm looking for the specific track record and seeing if uh, this person has uh, done uh, things that we wanted to uh, w want to develop in our organization because we're still a young company we want people with experience and help which people who would help us build the like, processes and functions so we would look into that and then when we meet uh, someone we'll be looking at the culture fit yeah i think that's a very important company in terms of what we do uh, I would be looking at seeing whether this person will be fitting the team, will be willing to take initiative, will be able to work on its, on 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 her, her own or his own, and basically drive the process going forward. So be a risk taker. Uh, I mean, to that extent, I find I often find it challenging to hire someone from very large companies because people there will be working. Uh, they will be very uh, like deep experts in terms of, in, in very narrow niches yeah. whereas in our case you have to do lots of stuff at the same time right. and solve lots Multiple of problems and, and, and sort of the mess we have right yeah yeah absolutely you know um over your time in finance what have been some of the biggest changes that you've seen from even a technology standpoint from when you first started to where we are today what would you say would be some of those most significant changes I think one of the pronounced changes is the move of uh, say enterprise ERPs into cloud. Mm -hmm. So that's probably uh, that's probably I think the biggest change that we have. Uh, previously, you would own this large piece of software which you have to uh, set up, for, like fine tune, and then continue to run. So I think it's becoming slightly more easier with uh, this whole thing moving into the cloud and being more standardized. Uh, then introduction of uh, SaaS itself. Success yeah. concept now that people can buy software with their credit cards all across the organization without you actually knowing that. Yeah. So it's another set of challenges. We work in this business ourselves, so we want people to buy our software easily, but right. uh, so do other companies. So, I mean, I How would. How are you I managing would, those costs with the credit cards out of control? Uh, we are uh, working on that. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me put it this way. So, it's, it's an interesting challenge. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're trying to introduce policies and ask uh, and try to centralize certain things so we can get better deals from some things which we have already now know are present in our organization so we can manage that. But it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, challenge to work with. Yeah. So I think those will be my two biggest ch things or biggest changes which I can think about. Right. And so um, and what do you think has caused that proliferation of this massive credit card spend? I mean, I would probably attribute some of that to SaaS and everybody needs a tool for this or that. But, um, you know, 15 years ago, how do you think things were managed versus how they're managed today? Yeah, 15 years ago, you would need to buy a box with a CD, right? And then have it installed and then make it work in your on your computer, which will, probably was not as easy as having a web-based access to a tool which uh, you can buy easily and then forget about it and it'll be continued to, the company will continue to charge you forever right. so, so i think we on our side are also is trying to make it as easy as frictionless as possible for someone to buy the product and start using it immediately in a good way yeah. and i think that's uh that's i guess a generally good thing but it has its own implications for yeah. finance absolutely because you need to have oversight into everything that you're all the spend that's going on out there. And if you don't know about it, how can you manage it? Yeah, I guess there are tools to deal with that. I mean, starting with, I mean, there, there, are, there will be tools to manage the tools, as we know right now. <laughs> there will be, absolutely. I mean, there are, there are. So yeah. we know there are tools to manage the tools. So you can take control of it if you spend, like put enough effort. But again, that's, it depends on how, like, how high on, a pre, on your priority list it is. Yeah. Well, given all of the technology that enters uh, finance today in your organization, how has that changed what, you know, in some ways, the technological aptitude of your hires and the, your team? We're trying to, what we're trying to institute as mindset, we're trying to say things, the data that we were providing has to be as real time as possible. Mm -hmm. And it has to be easily accessible by anyone within the organization. Right? So we're trying to get away from Excel's PowerPoints or PDFs. Yeah. And I guess this is the biggest challenge which I'm facing. We as to migrate uh, 
our team internally, our finance team from the Excel data distribution to more online data access tool right. for our more internal clients. Right. So that's, I think this is the challenge that I'm, I'm facing right now. Right. Getting them, getting everybody all in one, one place, so to speak on that right. end. And then, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm really curious to like where you think that, um, you know, the future of finance is going and the future of work in finance. Mm -hmm. As we see, it has to do, it's, it used to be working with data, but now it's becoming more and more about uh, being able to organize and process data, right? So build models, structure databases, being able to integrate all of that. So I think we are leaning towards uh, being more IT in the way, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least uh, the way I think about this, more in, into the IT math sort of things like data processing, data gathering, data analysis. So I think we, we, we're we starting to merge with that part of, uh, the, of world. Over the world, right? Yeah. And, you know, one of the other kind of conversations I hear about are whether or not a CFO should be more of an MBA or a CPA. Any thoughts on on that in general, like what it's going to take to succeed? I'm, 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 I'll be very biased. I'm coming from the investment part, part of the world, right? So I've, uh, I've never been an accountant. So uh, I'd say no to C. I I mean, you don't have to have a CPA or Probably I don't know how value how much value do, does MBA have these days, right? It, it, it used to be very popular when I was younger. <laughs> so, Seems so like I'd it might say, be a data science degree, right? So I would say yes. I mean, if if uh, I mean finance will probably I mean your, your general finance knowledge will probably be a no brainer. You have to have it. But then, do you have really have to be very strong in, in extremely technical accounting to be a C four? I'd say no because I'm not. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, I guess you really have to be able to understand how to build a, your company model and get this data into one place and then disseminate it to, with, throughout the organization. Yeah, and the accuracy of the data. And Absolutely. How it's, I mean, that's like one of the most important things because as soon as you present a number that nobody believes or they poke holes in it, I mean, that's a hard lesson learned definitely on the marketing side for sure. Always making yeah. sure you've got accuracy on that part as well. So That's right. I agree with that completely. Well, great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation and, um, you know, I look forward to seeing all the wonderful things that come out of SEMrush uh, moving forward. And, um, you know, any other last parting advice for young, inspiring uh, finance professionals on what they should do to move forward in their career? I think when I think about finance, and the important things that, that I personally learned is that oh, you have to be able to build good relationships within the organization. So it's not about, only about the numbers, right? It's about how you how to make sure that people are getting your numbers, understanding your numbers, and are, are able to interact with you based on what you provide to them. Right. So I think that's the that's human part is very important. So it's yes. not uh, it's not only about data, but how how you actually what you do with this data, how you work with your peers. Yeah, in some ways it comes down to establishing that trust that you can trust that they'll work with you will work together and uh making sure that everyone's goals are aligned to make it all happen right and you want to be useful to them right so it's not only that you come and say you, you give me data and i'll go and, uh, and crunch it right so you, you want to bring them something they will be able to use to make uh, decisions which will benefit the company right exactly great well, thank you so much again. Uh, enjoyed our time today and uh, appreciated having you on. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany.